Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as is often the case when we have a guest speaker and whatever the subject matter is, I tend to try to find an interesting question that intrigues me and wind up doing a kind of dive into that subject for some interesting little tidbits. And so uh, the questions afternoon are those uh, materials that have been banned or productive material that has been scandalized. And of course, we're all familiar with the attitude toward books and, and art and, and movies and such. I decided to check out poetry. And so uh, I was investigating what was provocative or scandalized about poetry over history. And I found uh, a few examples that I'm going to share with you. Uh, the first being Allen Ginsberg. He did uh, the poem Howl. This prompted sting operations, arrests, and a long series of trials. Howell has faced more scrutiny than perhaps any other work of poetry. It was published by fellow beat poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti in 1956. Controversial lines include America, go F yourself with your atom bomb. And when I first got laid, HP graciously took my cherry. I don't know who HP was, but I'm sure somebody knows. Ginsburg's uncompromising language brought severe consequences for the author and his publisher. The second edition of Howl was printed in England in 1957, and U.S. Customs seized all 520 copies. Gwendolyn Brooks, her poem, We Real Cool. Published in 1960, Gwendolyn Brooks wrote We Real Cool for her book, The, Be the, uh, the Bean Eaters. It recalls the attitudes of a group of rebellious, cool young men who leave school to lurk late and sing sin. This poem was banned in West Virginia and Nebraska schools, presumably over the line, We Jazz June, which some believe to be a reference to sex. Brooks denied this, and some have even argued that this misinterpretation demonstrates a white-centric misunderstanding among the book's censors. Finally, Ovid, his poem Ars Amatoria. Written in the year 8 CE by Roman poet Ovid, Ars Amatoria, or The Art of Love, has been a work of banned poetry for over 2,000 years. It includes three separate books, all with the purpose of offering advice about courtship and romantic relationships. Portraying himself as a teacher of love, Ovid was banished from Rome for his scandalous insinuations about sex and romance. In 1497, all of Ovid's works were burned in Savon, let's see, Savonarola's infamous bonfire for being erotic, impious, and tending to corrupt. And there you have it. There are a couple of others, but you can seek them out yourselves. The European colonists were very much into banning lots of people, the Brits especially. Anybody who wrote something they didn't like, poem, a pamphlet, a story, they would call it seditious. They had very strict sedition laws, very widespread sedition laws, and just banned it. One of the poets who was banned in the late last century, no, late uh, 19th century, happened to be my, my mother's great grandfather. And his 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 poetry was uh, only pub sorry his poetry was published sort of in the underground and only came was pu was published openly after the independence. Anyway. Speaker, very timely. Today's speaker is Dr. April Dawkins, assistant assistant professor Depa uh, department of information library and research science at the University of North Carolina, North Carolina at Greensboro. Dr. Dawkins will be talking about facing the censorship challenge, librarians and community members work. Sure. Okay. All right, sorry, because I have a hard time walking. I don't want to try to get up and then fall down. Um, um, Dr. Dawkins is an assistant professor in the uh, Information, Library, and Research Sciences Department at UNC Greensboro. ILRS is part of the School of Education, 
Prior to joining UNCG, she was high school librarian and high school social studies teacher in North Carolina for 21 years. Her research focuses on intellectual and in school libraries and the preparation of school librarians. She is the editor of Intellectual Freedom Issues in School Libraries um, and co-author of the seventh edition of the School Library Manager, Leading Through Change. A recent article published in the School of uh, Library Research and co-edited by Emily Edison, received the AASL Research Grant Award in 2022. She serves on the advisory board of the Get Ready, Stay Ready Toolkit, an adv advocacy tool uh, for parents and caregivers. She also currently serves on the executive board of the Association of the School Librarians and as director at large. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina, where my wife also uh, graduated. Um, let's see, she also has a, a, a teaching fellow, a master's of library science from NC Central University and a doctor of philosophy and information science from the University of South Carolina. So we welcome Dr. Dawkins to talk to us today and we are getting our uh, hookup ready for her, her slideshow. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much for your introduction and for the invitation to join you today. Um, so I'm a, I'm a North Carolina native. Um, I'm from here. I'm from Richmond County, North Carolina. So the city of Rockingham. Yeah, I am tall. <laughs> so um, I, you know, went to Meredith. I did my master's degree at uh, Central in Durham, North Carolina Central, and then my doctorate at South Carolina. And um, I had no idea when I decided that my focus in my dissertation research and my research agenda uh, was going to be on intellectual freedom that the current situation was going to occur. Um, we used to tell future school librarians and librarians that if you ever face a challenge to content, this is how you should handle it. And now I tell my students, when you face a challenge, here are some potential ways to handle it because the challenges are different as well from the way they used to be. So I, I have too many slides, you know, typical professor, um, but I encourage you if you've got questions in the middle, I am fine with, you know, interrupting, asking questions. Yes, sir. Okay, we can do that. That's okay with you. You'll never finish your slides. Okay. Well, I'm okay with that, but you may not be. So um, this is a quote from Judy Bloom. Um, Judy Bloom is actually getting ready to get this big award um, next week. But letting children read what they want and then talk with them about it. And I think this is the issue that we have going on right now is a lack of communication between adults and kids and teenagers. Uh, we we have such very divergent interests these days that um, a lot of what kids want to talk about makes adults uncomfortable, and that discomfort leads to a lack of communication. So uh, the First Amendment is really the foundation of the idea of intellectual freedom, academic freedom, um, and the right to receive and speak and, and receive information to speak freely and this is really where the right to read comes from. It's not, of course, explicitly stated in the First Amendment or in the Constitution, but it's referred to as what's called a corollary uh, to the First Amendment. And so here, of course, in the, in the First Amendment, you'll see abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. So this is where the right to access information, where intellectual freedom finds its support in the United States. So Justice William Brennan really articulated this in 1965, but it had been discussed prior to that. Uh, but you know, we connect this to censorship, uh, and so I'll have students who will walk in, and, and we hear adults who say, you know, um, uh, Facebook cannot restrict my speech. And I'm like, well, Facebook isn't the government; it's a private company, even though it's publicly held stocks. They can do whatever they want. The government doesn't have the right to restrict speech. 
So how does this relate to libraries and schools? If they are publicly funded, they are considered to be a government entity. So this is why public libraries and publicly funded schools cannot restrict speech within reason. And so the rights of minors are another whole issue. What we've seen is the steady erosion of the rights of minors over the years. So uh, if you think back to your civics, high school civics days, um, Tinker versus Des Moines is what really established the idea that minors have rights uh, even inside a school building. But um, what we've seen over time is that there have been restrictions placed on that. Uh, that you know, news school newspapers have had articles um, not allowed to be published, and what we're seeing right now is a superseding right of parents uh, over minors. And you know, it, it's a difficult issue because parents should be able to know what kids are doing and and interact with their kids. One of the problems that I have with a lot of these changes that I'm seeing is that there's no distinction made between a five-year-old and an 18-year-old uh, in a school in terms of their rights, especially in North Carolina. Some states have different, uh, different things going on, but I'll talk a little bit about the changing in the laws in just a few minutes. So over time, um, we've seen uh, a lot of public opinion around uh, books and what's available and databases and what what kids have access to. Uh, but the American Library Association did a survey back in 2022. So most of this kicked off really, you know, 2016 to 20 and then 2020 and 2021 really were the impetus for a lot of change because of COVID. And we had kids who weren't in school, they were being taught at home. And all of a sudden, parents are seeing everything that's happening in the classroom. And, and a lot of it, they didn't understand. And so there was a lot of questions around what was happening. Um, but what we have found through the data that's been collected is that most people oppose book bans. Uh, they don't want them removed from school libraries, particularly if they will listen to both sides of the argument. The problem we have, again, is communication, listening to each other. So voters oppose removing books from school libraries by 67% and parents, that number is a little bit lower. So I'm sorry, this is so small, but this is also talking about public libraries. So the first one was school libraries, this is public libraries. So 70, over 70% 70 oppose removing books from public libraries. Um, and this seems to go across the board. Um, and it's not as high um, in different things, but um, parents also oppose efforts to remove books from public libraries by an almost 20 point margin. So you can see that there's, there is a difference so uh, NPR did a study in uh, early 2023, and this was published in June. And this is looking about schools. So the, again, this is a year after things have gotten really heated. And you know, to what extent, if at all, do you support or oppose each of the following? So allowing school boards to ban certain books and remove them from classrooms and libraries. So overall, um, what you'll see is that 13% uh, think that, you know, that's okay. Um, parents of K-12 students, that number is a little bit different. And then state lawmakers passing laws to ban things. And that number gets, that even fewer think state lawmakers can make, should make that decision um, because a lot of them don't know much about schools. I mean, everyone goes to school, but um, if you remember, what I've seen a lot is people thinking, oh, this is what school was like when I was there, and these are the books they should be reading, reading because that's, those are the books I read, and they're classics, and those should never be removed from their curriculum. And I'm like, well, they were classics when schools were all white, and uh, there were no services for students with disabilities, 
but we still need to keep reading those? That's a problem. So this is just recently released, actually like January 4th. And this was a project between Book Riot, which is a big, um, it's a reviewing source for materials. Um, and then uh, Every Library, which is a nonprofit that seeks to support uh, libraries of all kinds. And there are a lot of statistics here. I'm not going to go through all of them. But these, they did three series of surveys. They did one with um, parents and guardians. Uh, they did one with um, the general public. Um, and they did one focused primarily on parent. I said parents already. Uh, but they, they had three different surveys that they did. Um, and it, it was interesting to see 85% of the public says that they trust librarians. And that's both public and school librarians. 58% um, of parents think public librarians should be responsible for what books are selected. 92% said libraries are safe spaces for kids. And this is something that we really believe in. If you, if you look at the sort of the uh, code of ethics for the library profession, uh, is that we believe we should be a space for everyone. 75% um, do not believe their libraries are experiencing book bans. Well, we not, may not be experiencing a ban which means the absolute removal of the book. But there may be restrictions placed on the books, like it, um, if you have a book challenged in a middle school, it may be that that book gets moved to the high school level. Or it could be that you can only read it with parental permission, so you have to get a signed statement from the parent saying that permission to read a specific book. So there are other ways that, are, that there are restrictions being placed on the right to read it doesn't necessarily mean an overall ban. And I think we've sort of used that, overused that term uh, to talk about what's happening. Uh, because uh, we have been involved with a lawsuit in, in Missouri, and we tried to get a preliminary injunction to get books back on the shelf in a high school. And the judge said, these books aren't banned. They can buy them from Amazon or borrow them from a friend. And I'm like, uh, no, that's not what banning means. Uh, if you're a student who has no money or you're embarrassed about what you want to read about, you're not going to get access to that book if it's not in the school library. Uh, school libraries are really, really important because not every child has access to a public library for a number of reasons. No transportation to get there, parents who work three jobs. So the one place where students can be guaranteed to have access to information and books and research is to go to their school library. That's why school libraries are so very, very important. 57% um, think banning books from the school library is an appropriate way to prevent them from learning about certain topics. It's an appropriate way to get them to not learn about certain topics. Uh, and a lot of respondents think that we should have content rating systems for books. And it's really hard to do that. Uh, this is something that Texas is trying to do. Um, and I'll talk about the lawsuit in Texas related to the bill that they passed requiring vendors to rate their own books. So Every year, the American Library Association gathers data about what books get challenged. And we call them the, the, the it's Banned Books Week every October. And um, they put a top 10 list. There are more than 10 this year because there was a three-way tie. Um, uh, so is anybody familiar with these books? So I've given you very cryptic pictures. So I'm going to do a little laser thing. So here, anybody know what, which book this is? There was a challenge to it here in Orange County at one of the um, Orange County schools. This one is gender queer. Sorry, I can do it like this. You've given me too many things to hold. Okay. This one, anybody know what this one is? I've given um, Chris the slides. Is it? And he could share these later with you. This is All Boys Aren't Blue. 
This one is a classic and part of the canon in many high school English classes. Yes, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. This one, this one is called Flamer. It's a graphic novel and it is a memoir. Uh, this is Long Boy. Um, there are two Long Boys, by the way, uh, that are out there. Um, one is geared toward younger folks. This one is geared toward more toward high school students. Um, and um, when it gets challenged, people confuse the two because they haven't read it. They just heard about this book. Uh, this one is John Green's Looking for Alaska. Terrific book. There's also a uh, movie related to it. This one is, it's not going to come to me. I've got it on the next slide. Um, it's been made into a movie as well. It's very good. Uh, Sherman Alexie's True, um, True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. This one is Out of Darkness by Ashley Hope Perez. And it's a historical novel about the worst school explosion in the U.S. Uh, and it occurred in Texas in the 30s. It, they thought it was deliberate, but it really wasn't. Uh, this is Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. There's a movie about that one, too. Uh, this is a novel in verse. You were talking about poetry. So novels in verse do get challenged fairly often. This is Crank by Ellen Hopkins, which is based on her daughter's struggle with meth. And so um, this is what's problematic about it. It's pretty, I mean, it has mature themes. These are not just books banned in schools, but schools are more than half of the challenges occur there. This is a big one right now, A Court of Thorns and Roses or A Court of Mist and Fury. It's the uh, Akatar series by, whose name won't come to me right now. Uh, the first book I think is fine for high schoolers, but then as the books continue, I would agree that the, they are adult books. But our teenagers read the first book and then they want to read the rest of them. And then this one is called This Book is Gay. Great book. So this is the whole list here. So when you see the slides, you can see them all. So yeah, oh, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. I can't believe I couldn't remember the name of that one because I got to meet the author and we got to see the premiere of the movie at ALA back in 2012 or 13. Um, so um, all of these are really terrific books. Are they the right book for every kid? No, but does that mean we shouldn't give any kid access to them? No. Uh, this, uh, the other thing that's interesting about this list from 2022 is that all of these are considered to be um, middle or high school level books. Usually there's at least one elementary book on the list. Um, or one, what I would consider to be completely adult book on the list, but these really are marketed for teens. So, you know, why do we have books like this in the library? You know, it, it's about safe spaces. So the Human Rights Campaign uh, did a study looking at, you know, why uh, LGBTQ students in particular, um, what, what benefits do they have from going to the library? So mainly, uh, they see the library as a safe space that is accepting of them. Uh, and so school safety is a big part of it. Almost half of LGBTQ youth, including half of transgender and gender expansive youth, reported feeling unsafe um, in at least one school setting. But nine, almost nine out of 10, said the library was safe. So we have a problem. 
because by challenging books, particularly books that are about LGBTQ students or students of color, what we're saying is those people are not acceptable as well. That's how they perceive it, that I'm not safe because they think books about people like me are bad, that they're, you know, not acceptable. So I had a group of people ask me, well, you know, what about reading these books? Doesn't it harm kids? So there has been research about, you know, students who read books that have been challenged or banned. And what they found was that these kids are much more empathetic with their fellow humans. They, The students, when they were interviewed, say that we are becoming better people because we can see other people's perspectives. Their parents also noticed that they were becoming empathetic. So it wasn't just an internal thing that was happening. Their behaviors out in the world were changing. They were less judgmental. They were morally stronger. They were looking for multiple viewpoints. A lot of things I think we need in the world right now. They were also happier, which I think, and this is what the kids voluntarily told. These were not specific questions. Uh, this study was done by Gay Ivy and Peter Johnston. Uh, the book is a, is a little bit older, but uh, Gay Ivy is our one of our endowed professors at UNCG in literacy. And uh, she did this study in collaboration. And the kids that they were talking about were middle schoolers that they worked with and interviewed. So we know that in 2022, um, there were 1,269 attempts to remove books from libraries. Now, this number is in no way accurate because it is self-reported by librarians across the country to the Office for Intellectual Freedom at the American Library Association. Many, many librarians do not report. They worry about backlash and worry about their jobs. The other thing is that ALA does not keep records for oral challenges or just complaints. They only keep records for things that go to a formal process. So if someone subverts the formal process and just removes the book from the shelf, like a principal or a board member or a parent, just goes in and takes the book, then there's no reporting. They're also gathering data about hate crimes and hate speech in libraries. We've had books that have been swastika um, We've had other things like that. We've had threats against librarians because they say we're grooming kids. So, and yes, I have received one of those emails. So, but the other thing about this is it's, there's a stark look. We know 2020 why there weren't many challenges. Kids weren't in school. Nobody was, you know, you, you could use your public library if you had ebook subscription, but you know, most of the librarians were not working as librarians at that point. But then the number has gone and gone. And we already know it's going to be bigger for 2023. That data will be re released during American Library Week, which is in April. It's usually the third week of April. 90% of all challenges were based on lists. And this is what's new. Usually it was a parent saying, my child brought this book home and I have a real problem with this book. And usually we could have a conversation and come to a resolution. Uh, or if they really insisted that no one should read this book, then they would go through the process. But what we're getting now is a list of books I think shouldn't be on shelves. Sometimes we actually have those books and sometimes we don't because where are they getting their lists from outside agitators primarily? And we do have some parents who keep, you know, who have legitimate concerns, but often it's fueled by groups, organized groups. So this is preliminary data through August. They have never done this before. 
They have never released preliminary data before the end of the year. So I haven't seen any data since then. So there were 700 attempts. So this doesn't mean 700 titles. There were actually 3,923 titles, but 695 actions took place to try to remove books or restrict access. More than 100 challenges in the following states, and there is lovely little North Carolina. So, yeah. And if you're familiar with it, uh, with if you you know keep up with what's happening in schools in particular, this was kicked off in 2021 uh, by Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, um, publicly speaking about the filth in our schools and in our school libraries. And he targeted four specific books, including Out of Darkness, Gender Queer, Lone Boy, and the fourth book I can't remember, but he targeted Orange County Schools. So the two high schools here, he pointed them out, particularly and said they have these books on their shelves. Now, I'm going to tell you, your Orange County School Board is a bunch of brave people because they listened to their school level committee. They went through the process. Then they listened to their district level committee. I mean, they they stumbled a bit to start with by saying, I, so one of my students was one of the librarians. You can get hired in a school library before you finish your master's degree because they already had a teaching degree. So she's dealing with this. But it started out by saying, well, you didn't purchase any of these books and the person before you didn't follow proper procedure to add them to the collection. So therefore, we don't have to follow proper procedure to remove them. And I'm like, didn't you just say two wrongs don't make a right to them? And she did. She went back to them and said, that doesn't make it right. So they followed their procedures. But librarians shouldn't have to tell their principals how to do what's right and to follow their own policies. So they did, and the school level committee agreed, the district level committee agreed they needed to stay on the shelf, and then the school board had a nice long meeting where they discussed them. It was done over Zoom, of course, during that time. And basically said, we're not going to override the experts, our librarians and teachers across the district, and those books will stay on the shelf. And so their rules said that they could be reconsidered in five years. If someone wanted to complain, they said, no, these books are acceptable forever. I was like, wow. I was so impressed because... That's often not what's happening. So then what's happening now is we have a lot of folks who are agitators, but this is their platform where they will get their 15 minutes of fame. And you can see how I feel about things. And I'm just going to be honest. I'm not a neutral party here. Um, we have a lot of folks who've decided, well, this is how I'm going to make my name for myself and get my power. I'm going to run for school board and this is my platform. Teachers and librarians are grooming kids and books are bad and we're going to get them out of the schools. And that's our platform. And they, in some places it's working and they're getting elected and in some places they're not. But this is why local elections are really, really, really important. And school board elections in particular are important. So ask the questions. What do you believe? What do you want to do? What would you do in this situation? Do you believe that educators are professionals, that they are trained? So censorship occurred, 220 reports in school library, school districts, and 208 in public libraries. Now, other there are other places as well, because there are more than this, but um, School districts, these numbers are really interesting because public libraries typically is much lower. So what we're seeing is that they're getting their way in schools a lot of the time. And so therefore, they're shifting their focus to public libraries. If you want to read about disturbing stuff, read about Lafayette Parish in Louisiana. I have a friend who's a school librarian in that school district. She doesn't work for the public library, but she got up to speak at a public hearing about intellectual freedom and public libraries as a private citizen, not as the school librarian, and 
She then has dealt with public harassment, um, threat, death threats. Um, and so there's a huge lawsuit related to it. But her name is Amanda Jones. She's been um, in quite a few national newspapers recently. So when school libraries and school boards decide that they're going to keep things in the collection, instead they turn to state level control because they can't control the local school board. So we're seeing the growth of what, what uh, PEN America, which is the Writers Guild, uh, refers to as educational gag orders. And we saw this a lot uh, because there was this big movement against what they call, what they thought was critical race theory, which is not what they define it. Critical race theory to those who've been complaining about it is anything that says that uh, African-Americans in this country are still dealing with, with um, inequities and civil rights is not over. Um, they don't want to teach kids that slavery was a bad institution because they learned skills which is what Florida includes in their textbook. So we're seeing a, a spate of laws across the country. Uh, it was up 250% in 2022. Uh, the one that's probably most famous is the Florida Parental Bill of Rights, which became known as the Don't Say Gay Law. And basically it restricted uh, teaching about anything about gender, sexuality, anything uh, below fourth grade. Now, that's not a problem. The problem is that they classified anything to do with gender, including a child who has two parents, any books that dealt with different types of families as sexuality. And I'm like, hmm, I don't think so, because we've do a lot with heteronormative families with, with mom and a dad, and we don't say that that's about sexuality. So, you know, are we going to remove all of those books too, where we've got two different parents um, of two different genders? So it, the law itself is just badly written. And um, because it's so vague and the way they can, uh, what books they can have in their collections and what teachers can do, that it, it has acted as a gag order. So they've been going through and deciding which books get added or removed from collections across the state. They had a group of people come in and train librarians on which books were appropriate and not a group of parents who made that decision for everyone's child. So right now in Florida, they're deciding whether or not the dictionary gets to go into the elementary school libraries because there are words in there, words that they don't like. So that decision I hear will come out in the next week or two. And I'm, I'm really, I'm not joking. It is happening. In Tennessee, they have passed what's called the Age Appropriate Materials Act. And part of that is that they have to uh, publicly list every book in the library collection and every book in every classroom collection. So library collections are easy. We can print you a PDF and give you that list or an Excel spreadsheet, or you can just go online and look in our catalog. Not hard to do, but classroom collections that have been purchased with the teacher's own funds or by the school. And let's say you've got 400 books in your room. When exactly are you going to do that? You're going to provide the title, the author, the description of the book, the grade level of the book, all of this. And so in some cases, uh, librarians are being told that they're to do this. So yeah, when am I gonna teach classes? And in some cases, because there's so much that needed to get done by a certain date, uh, the classroom teachers instead just boxed up their books and took them home. So again, restricting access so make the law so vague and so difficult that they're going to still get what they want, removing access to information. So these are the trends for the past year or so. 
uh, of the legislation, curriculum censorship, uh, if it's a divisive concept that might make my child feel bad about themselves or uncomfortable, then you can't teach it. Um, targeted regulation of what they call sexually explicit materials in public libraries. And I got to tell you, their definition of that is very, very broad. Like, you know, there's a kiss in a book that's sexually explicit. One of the problems we have is that our laws we, we have obscenity laws in place, but they've sort of decided that this is obscene if it's explicit, but I wouldn't call it explicit. Um, attacks on funding mechanisms. So we've seen the um, removal of budgets from public libraries. The public libraries have had to close. That happened in Connecticut, I think. Um, Ex eliminating long-standing legal protections for librarians and educators. So we have limited immunity from prosecution because a kid checked out a book that, you know, might not be what the parent wants. So, you know, we have a lots, lots of things that happen, but the idea is that they're going to use this to basically silence voices and convince librarians that they can only provide this very white-centric um, looking at old canon, old books view because modern books deal with the tough issues that kids are dealing with. Uh, Parents' Bill of Rights, and I'm going to get to that because we have our own in North Carolina, uh, targeted regulation of databases. So this is really targeted um, some of them, like EBSCO, uh, which is a big database vendor, and there are lots of different databases. And most states provide some databases to their schools and public libraries. In North Carolina, we have NC Live for public and academic uh, libraries and, and public universities, which provides access to lots of databases. And in the schools, we have um, what's called NC Wise Owl, which is additional databases just for school libraries or school use. Um, but there's there are discussions around, you know, they're getting access to materials that are not um, age appropriate. And I have a problem with that term because age appropriate assumes that everyone who's 12 is the same, or everyone who's 14 is the same and can handle the same materials. I prefer that we switch to use age relevant. It is relevant to them as a 14 year old or an eight year old or a 12 year old. And that would be different for each child, which is why banning a book hurts kids because there are some kids in that school who may really benefit from that book. Um, parental oversight boards. So getting to make the final decision, veto power over what gets purchased. And there is also sort of the opposite of that. Um, Illinois passed a law saying you cannot ban a book uh, in a public library, um, which is problematic in itself because instead what they'll do is they'll target the selection process so the book never ends up in the library. So they're, you know, it's not dealing with the root of the problem. And there's a national right to read legislation going on as well. So North Carolina passed this, you know, in one of their uh, last minute sessions that they have. Um, this is what was called Senate Bill 49. Um, and this bill uh, was um, passed in February of 2023, vetoed by the governor. And then at the last minute in July, they came back and overrode the veto. So the the bill is interesting. I encourage you to go and read it to see what all it has in it. And it, it's basically copycat language from other states. But in particular, there are two, you know, two things I worry about. Student privacy is a big issue here because they won't, um, every time a child checks out a book, they want there to be a report sent to the parent that this book is the one that was checked out which I have no problem with a five-year-old because the parent's just trying to keep track of the books, things like that. But as they get older, 
Shouldn't they have increasing levels of privacy and autonomy? I mean, we want to prepare them to be functioning adults. So this applies to five-year-olds and 18-year-olds, as long as they are still under a parent's care. Um, so that, that issue is a, this is a problem because there is an existing law about library records that says that they are private and cannot be shared with anyone. Uh, and that also applies to public school libraries. They actually define it in the statute. It says, explicitly states public school libraries. So we now have these two laws working in conflict. So what's a school library to do? What does their district tell them? Well, districts, of course, are going to err on the side of caution. If it's vaguely worded, they're going to err on the side of caution. So what do they do? They, they remove books. They agree. They comply. Now, the problem is we don't really have a built-in mechanism to do this automatically right now. There was a big push against the major vendor that we use for our circulation systems to add this component to it. And the librarians across the country just got up in arms and basically bombarded the company and said, you better not do this. So the company backed down and said, we're not going to do it. But if they then, if your principal insists, then you're going to have to figure out a way to do that. And that's more of your time taking up doing that and not working with parents. Every time you have a book that's challenged, it has to be read by your entire reconsideration committee. And typically the librarian is the one who chairs that committee. You have to get members of the committee. You have to find copies of the book. You may have to buy copies of the book, which I find ironic. Um, and then everyone has to read it. And then they have to you know, meet together and then have a decision. That takes time. And if you get 20 books challenged at the same time, that becomes your full-time job. Well, I talked with a, a supervisor and they said they're doing all of theirs outside of school hours. And I'm like, but you're not being paid to work outside of school hours. She said, no, but we'd rather spend our time during the school day working with kids. That's not right. I mean, if we're worried about, you know, funds and kids, you know, making sure that we are being good stewards of the taxpayer's money, we need to think about the man hours that all of this is taking and woman hours. Uh, so there are lots of laws out there, uh, court cases that have been uh, decided over time. Um, I mentioned Tinker. Uh, the one that school librarians love is uh, um, Island Trees versus Pico. And this is the only case to go to the Supreme Court that basically says that school boards don't have just outright control um, because they can't just remove something because they disagree with it. Um, they have to follow their own policies and procedures. And this is where I see a lot of schools and school boards getting into trouble because they're not following their own policies. So the lawsuit that I've been helping with in Missouri, that's what they did. They didn't follow their policies. I have a feeling I'm running long. Um, so I wanted to mention the Texas law. Texas um, passed House Bill 900, and in that one, they're requiring both the publishers and the book vendors to go back to books they have previously published and sold to the school districts and rate them as no no content, sexually explicit, or sexually relevant. Now, and they, they came up with this rating system, which is ridiculous. Um, and also, those folks sold those books 20 years ago. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll move to the, to the, let's see, I won't talk about that. So um, I want to encourage you to think about speaking up at school board meetings, at other events where you're, you know, this is happening, um, that you consider running for a school board or speaking at, at a meeting. And I wanted to share this resource. It's called the Get Ready, Stay Ready Toolkit. It's a resource for community members, parents, and caregivers. Um, and it has these modules in it that have lots of resources that can help. 
So for example, the civic engagement one, we have a legislative tracker for uh, every state. We follow which laws are being proposed. I have a research assistant who is creating this. Um, and we've been doing this for three years now. Um, we have some social media things. We have some webinars um, and that are already published. And from Henny's Communication, which is a crisis communication company. So how do you communicate better on social media? How do you say stay, stay safe with controversial topics? Um, resources around different topics. And we also have letters and templates. So if you want to write a letter to the editor, uh, you can do that. And this is coming soon. It's called ReadCon. And this is actually going to be training for librarians of all types to help implement the, the Get Ready, Stay Ready toolkit, but also to engage with their community in constructive dialogue when there are tense, you know, tense conversations happening. This is an IMLS-funded grant that I got um, uh, with the University of Iowa, and we hope to have this content ready by June. Again, consider taking the lead, run for office, run for the school board. Speak up, speak to your legislator, speak to the school board members. There, sorry about that. It went very, very nice. <laughs> so, questions? I'll come, we'll come to that. Uh, <clears throat> we are an organization that is entirely voluntary and receive no finance, financial support from any, uh, any other place. So we uh, do take up a Sunday collection. So Todd is passing around the baskets, but as as it is going around, we should go to question question and comments. Only thing I say is that please keep your question short. There may be many questions, and and your comment short. Ask a question, and then we will go around. If we go around everyone, then we will come back for the second. Or Mora will beat you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Where is the mic? Right there. Okay. I'm ready. Where's the question? Um, and, right there. Ah, and then right there. here. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, what I what I perceive mm -hmm. is a uh, more generalized anti intellect intellectualism. Mm -hmm. um, it. It, it was um, kind of localized to, to a fundamentalist community in the 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. and now it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and this seems to be another, an outgrowth yes. of that. Uh, it, it is tied to that. It's also tied to our current political climate um, because uh, the most prominent group, there, there are lots of groups who are organized, but the most prominent group involved with this is Moms for Liberty. And Moms for Liberty grew out of the anti-vax, anti-mask movement. Um, and they it was finding some other way to control things. And so this has become an outlet for them to control um, education. Um, and also, I think it's part of the widespread movement to to basically remove public education, um, because I believe that that is the end goal. <clears throat> yes, sir. So I wore this today in honor of you. Um, Love I, your shirt. I wear this to the gym and other places. So far, the response has been positive. I haven't mm -hmm. taken any heat. I'm sorry. All right, thank you. I, think I can hear it. So this is a, I subscribe to a magazine uh, and to the organization Americans United. And they have a, a long article about book banning mm -hmm. and uh, being concerned about Christian nationalism being yes. behind it. So this is from PEN America for the fiscal year July 1st to 2022 to June 30th, 2023. They say there were 3,362 incidents of book banning in public classrooms and libraries, 38% increase over the quite previous year. Um, they also go into the, the the idea that this is not new. No. This goes back to the Comstock laws after the Civil War. Um, and the McCarthy era. Comic book banning during the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And what was mentioned in Ginsburg's Hall, Robert Kennedy was involved in that. 
Um, so it's um, a serious problem. I love libraries. It's a serious problem and uh, mm -hmm. one that we need to do something about. And incidentally, there's a great uh, exhibit at the Chapel Hill Public Library, original paintings by people on book banning. It's oh. marvelous. Yeah. Oh, nice. I might have to run by there on my way home. Um, I, I will say that PEN America has done some really good work. Uh, I know Jonathan, who wrote that article, we're actually on a coalition together um, with educators, professors, and publishers, and database vendors. We all work together. Our next meeting is February 15th. PEN America, the way they collect their data is a little bit different, and so um, he recently spoke in front of a House committee, and of course, um, that's going to be difficult because of who runs the House committees, uh, but they really gave him a hard time about how the data was collected, and he they collect their data differently from the way ALA does, um, and they include any attempt to challenge a book or complaint about a book or other things, um, and so their numbers are going to be higher than ALA's numbers. Um, but, you know, they're doing, they're working hard to try to, to deal with this. But they also did a lot of the research around the educational gag orders that I mentioned, and they keep track of that. So I, I read their stuff all the time because it's really good. And they also have been involved with, um, so that HB 900 that I mentioned in Texas, um, there was a preliminary injunction against the state to stop this. Uh, which was appealed, and we got uh, the appeals approved the injunction on Wednesday of this past week, so it stays in place. Um, and I think they're going to lose that case because it's it's ridiculous and vague and not enforceable. So, I was just thinking when I'm listening to this, um, of course, topic of abortion has been very large mm -hmm. lately, and there was a quote, and I don't remember the exact quote, but the essence of it was, you know, if if you choose not to have an abortion for your your purposes, if it's not for you, then that's fine. You're discussing your body. But when you want to reach out to other people's mm -hmm. bodies, that's not, not fine. Right. And I kind of see that with books the same way. Mm -hmm. If you don't want your children to read things, that's your prerogative as a parent. Right. But saying that you don't want other people's children to read things is just not acceptable. It's it's interesting that that comes up because we say we believe in parental rights, but what's happening is one parent is usurping every parent's right by saying that this book shouldn't be available to any child. So I have no problem with a parent who comes in and says, I don't want my child to read this. Um, so and usually what I would do is put a note in their account. And so I would know that. Now, it's really hard to do if they say, I don't want any book that ever deals with this topic. I can't really do that. But you know, this is the job of you as the parent to have that conversation with your child. What are you reading right now? What is it about? Why don't we read it together? And I know that there are lots of parents out there that just don't have time, which is another whole societal issue around economics. But we need to not impose our will on everyone just because we think we know better than everyone. Thank you. Um, before I retired, I worked for NCLA and I was the archivist. And one of the interesting things when, when I was getting it was I inherited or got Gene Lanier's papers. They cleaned out his office when I got to do it. Um, and he was the head of intellectual, the Committee on Intellectual Freedom for the state of North Carolina. And it was interesting to read through his notes. And he flat out said it in a lot of his notes was that the group that you mentored or some other groups would put out lists. And it was mm -hmm. interesting to watch them come down through the state and they would write letters to school districts. And it, it was a wave and you could see it. Yeah. And it was characterized by objecting to books the library didn't own, not knowing what the what's we, you would go back to the parent and say, well, what do you do? Well, I don't know. I haven't read the book. Or I'm not going to read that, Phil. The, the um, list that had one sentence from the book. Yeah. And that's what they would quote in their letter, but they had not read the rest of the book. So, you know, he commented on that 
Also, this last thing about the privacy of public schools is going to be really interesting in that in colleges and universities, we have said for a long time that what your kid reads is not something I'm going to report to you. In colleges, in some cases, we have parents who are no longer supporting their child in any way. But I think writing a law that says every public school has to report to every parent who may still it's in some pre way preschool through twelfth grade. It doesn't apply to colleges and well, universities. But that's that's a problem. In but we schools. also have a growing population of minors on college and community college campuses through early colleges and middle colleges and, and things like that. And so they are facing challenges. And so for the first time, they're having to write reconsideration policies because they don't have them. Because usually what it's been is, well, just don't check it out then. Um, and so what we have is this growing swell of folks within the early college community, in particular at community colleges, where they're like, oh, um, my child is a minor and you have whatever it is in your collection and you shouldn't have that in your collection. And most of the time they're not having issues with uh, college level administration, understanding that they serve mostly adults. But in some cases, at the community colleges, they actually have more high school age kids on their campus than they do adults. Well, and Wake County is at this point, as a cost saving measure, working uh, merging public and school libraries in a building that's adjacent to the school, but is technically both those things. Uh, I worked um, at Athens Drive High School, and it was a combined public and school library. And what I've found is they are not successful. There are lots of internal issues. The community may love them, but there are lots of problems with them, um, mainly because you've got anyone in the community coming into the school library. I mean, it's what serves both the public and school library. And um, there are fights about budget and who has to work when. So it's... It's difficult. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to take um, Mike Carrier's prerogative and ask a question. Sure. Um, what uh, What is the response of not only the librarians, but um, other folks when uh, a classic work of literature? Um, and one, one that I sort of came across recently is uh, Shakespeare's 20th sonnet is essentially a love letter to a man. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have these kinds of uh, works, which are considered you know, high classical yeah. art, um, been attacked in that you're aware of? And what happens then? Well, yes, they, they do get challenged as well. I'll give you another example. Um, a Pulitzer Prize winning book, Mouse by Art Spiegelman, which is a graphic novel about the Holocaust got challenged in uh, middle school because th they're naked and in it, they're rats. And they're, they're like mice and cats. The, the characters are portrayed that way. The Nazis are the cats and the Jews are mice. And we're like, well, you know, in the Holocaust that happened, plus there's nothing to see here. I mean, they're implying that there were humans that were naked, but you're not actually seeing naked humans. Um, so they actually removed it from the middle school curriculum and moved it up to high school. Um, and it does happen. I mean, we've had, you know, the bluest eye, Toni Morrison, is typically a high school senior level text used in AP English classrooms, advanced placement classrooms. So my former school district, I used to be in Union County Schools, which used to be a really great school district, and now it's a bit of a mess. Um, they... Uh, when I was there, they challenged the bluest eye. The bluest eye is it's a tough read, but it's so good. And it's considered part of the AP curriculum. And so then this past spring, they challenged it again, and it was removed from all of the high school libraries and from the curriculum. So To Kill a Mockingbird gets challenged all the time because it uses the N-word. It's very stereotyped. Very thin. And so... Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion around that. My response to that is that there are books that are canon that we 
we maybe should think about adopting some newer books um, that we have that are comparable. So a lot of what I've been seeing lately are, if you've been using this book as canon, let's look at something else. Let's look at what might have comparable themes, because that book is problematic on a couple of levels, including the idea that you have to have a white savior to fix the world. And so, you know, there are, you know, it may be a book that you love and it meant a lot to you as a child, but that doesn't mean it still speaks to today's youth. That's why, you know, I don't, didn't keep Little House on the Prairie because it also has very bad stereotypes about Native Americans. And if you've got Native Americans in your school and they pick up that book. So sometimes we choose to remove books from our collection for reasons like that. But we also have to be careful that we're not letting our own prejudices make decisions for us. And this is why you've got a review process. Um, <clears throat> one book that made the most, the most impression on me regarding against the banning of books and I still love that book and read it, I don't know how many times I've read it, is Fahrenheit 451. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and um, so, it's a great book. Yes. Um, and I was just thinking that maybe it's the librarians and school teachers to sneak that book into the classroom. Oh, uh, they, they use it. It's actually part of curriculum in, some, in many districts across North Carolina uh, in ninth grade English. And I had a, a classroom English teacher who wanted to do a project around Fahrenheit 451 and dystopia and banning books. And so during the month where we have the banned books week, she had the, them read that as a class. And then they picked a modern contemporary young adult book that dealt with dystopian themes. And they did a comparison of what the themes were in the two books. What a great way to look at a classic, but also have something that's very contemporary and relevant to you. So there are ways that we can incorporate those classic books, but in it doesn't put them on such a pedestal and doesn't say that these are the best works ever written. You know, I think Shakespeare's terrific, but, you know, it's problematic too. I mean, R R Romeo and Juliet, if you're saying you're not going to allow anything that's sexually explicit, Romeo and Juliet's about two 14-year-olds misbehaving, taking drugs, killing themselves. Oh, suicide is something you better not bring up because that will convince them that they need to do that. That was the big thing against 13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher. Maybe you might remember pre-pandemic, it came out as a series on Netflix, and they did change that significantly, the way they handled the suicide in the TV series versus the book. But because parents had such an issue with the TV series, they challenged the book. And so the book, the way it, it ends is completely different, but they wanted it removed because the kids wanted to read the book now because there's a series. <laughs> Let's give a warm uh, round of applause. For the excellent Thank you. From I'll the come back and talk about something different next time. Well, uh, announcements. What announcements are there, Jennifer? So I just have a quick announcement, uh, change for change. <laughs> I'm forget what I'm talking about here. Yes, the North Carolina Community Bail Fund of Durham is who we're supporting this quarter. So please, if you have any extra change, help them out. They do help folks who cannot afford bail, people who are incarcerated for small amounts of bail. So thank you. Um, Dorothy, is the is are we having a happy hours? No. Yeah. Next Wednesday. I mean, this coming Wednesday. I think it's the fourth. I, I, sorry, it's not on my radar because it's not the one that I organize. So um, I'll reach out to Gretchen, and if there is one, it'll be in the mail. Okay. All right, Maura? Just as a reminder, yes, we are meeting here again in person next week. Um, it won't be necessarily the most riveting talk in the world because it is our members meeting. We'll be doing things like um, discussing who is willing to sacrifice their lives and sanity and be on the board. We have a, a few people who are still twisting arms up. Um, looking at one of them right now 
So if you get a chance to come in, the members meeting is also interesting because we will tell you about things that are going on just in general with the different committees and so forth. And even if you don't wanna be a member of the board, there are other committees that we might be able to get people to become more interested in. And also we get to see the budget. It's always nice to see how much money we have, where the money is going, how many um, cruised vacations Fred and I take, that kind of thing. Oh, uh, isn't that the so book yeah, club we'll, after this meeting? Yeah. We'll also be electing uh, officers, et cetera. So um, who has a... I'm sorry. Hank. Yeah, proxies. Uh, proxies. Those who cannot come can give me. If you wish to cast a vote and are not going to be there, you may give your proxy to a member who will be there. I think you need to send an email or something. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, uh, Mary, we have one more. Minor announcement for the refreshments. If you use one of the sort of paper bowls after you've used it, put it in the paper bag on the ground and I will compost it. And also, if you put the plastic utensils in that bag, I will wash them. Thank you. And remember to wash your hands before touching the uh, food. Who has a book group? Yeah, the, uh, our book group is meeting today at 3.30 in the Columbia Room, and we're discussing the book King, A Life. Uh, it's a, uh, it'll be run from 3.30 to 4.30, 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't read it, please feel free to come. If you have read it, please come. Mara, what is the topic next Sunday? Uh, oh, we know uh, the topic. Discussion. The members yeah. meeting. Yeah. Members meeting. All right. All Back right. To you. Well, I'd like to thank Mary for taking care of the refreshments, Jean and John for being greeting and uh, guests and feeling that making them feel welcome, Solomon for opening and closing words, uh, Chris, the Sultan of Zoom. Um, I I don't know whether the notices those th those things got put on outside. I don't know. Did it, did you do it? I'm sorry. Uh yeah, the signs out. But Solomon does have closing words. I know. Not okay. yet. And uh, <clears throat> finally, many thanks to Mora for hurting us, and with <clears throat> with her wandering to rule us all. So now Solomon, closing words. All right, carrying on with my curiosity about things that were provocative, scandalous, and bad, but uh, with a sort of lighter touch to them, I was curious about dances and how many of those were throughout history. So here's my list, gonna try to run through it quickly. Some of them you may know, good luck to you all. 1566, the La Volta, which is the, is the Italian word for turn. In the dance, the man pushes the woman forward with his thigh, one hand grasping her waist, the other below her corseted bodice. He leaps into the air. I don't have the slightest idea what that looked like. 1698, the cushion dance. The women could select and kiss their partners on the dance floor. 1816, the waltz. Intimate embrace, a man holding a woman in his arms on a public dance floor, their faces a few inches apart, was revolutionary. 1868, the can-can. In the late 1820s, a group of working class Parisians were dancing a quadrille. They improvised and kicked their legs in the air and the can-can was born. Middle class Parisians thought the lower classes looked as if they were suffering from a degenerative disease due to the flailing limbs involved in the can-can. 1913, the tango. Lurid descriptions in the press as a dance of cowboys, pimps, and prostitutes, as well as its use of Latin music intrigued and attracted many to the tango. 1925, the Charleston. Jazz became popular in the roaring 20s. The Charleston emerged. The footwork, flailing arms, and swinging hips were considered immoral and provocative. 1934, the jitterbug, like the Charleston, based on an African-American uh, dance, the Lindy Hop. Concerns were voiced for both the physical and moral well-being of those jitterbugging. 
1960, The Twist. <laughs> yeah, I know everyone in this room has done The Twist. <laughs> Uh, it was initially deemed to be vulgar and obscene, all of you folks out there, for similar reasons to the Charleston. As with the Charleston, medical concerns were raised and an orthopedic surgeon reported a rise in knee injuries. 1989, the Lambada. Just as the tango had scandalized by bringing couples nearer each other than the waltz, the Lambada had dancers even closer. The dance was allegedly banned by Brazilian President Getulio Varga when it first emerged in the 1930s because he was horrified by its immorality. Finally, 2013, twerking, which apparently is the last dance that scandalized the public, originated in West African dance moves. Twerking is believed to have arrived in the USA via Jamaican dance halls. Miley Cyrus, performed it on the MTV, uh, MTV Video Music Awards, which pushed it into the mainstream and caused a social media meltdown. There you have it. I'd love to see some of you twerking. <laughs> Thank you, Solomon. And our, um, our meeting has ended and our fellowship continues. Please join us for the refreshments and give a warm greeting to the person sitting next to you. And a handshake, a hug, and please, please join us in, the, in our uh, refreshments that Mary has so kindly provided. Uh, this is one thing I take to what Solomon said, that actually in the United States, the Argentine tango was banned. And a more sedate American tango was developed, and that is what you see mostly here. So, anyway. <laughs>